and Shannon and Linda are here. That's great. Last week, we, we were talking about uh, a passage in Romans, Romans chapter 8. We were talking about the condemning of sin and how God has accomplished that. And uh, as, as we move into uh, talking about forgiveness between one another, um, just very quickly, last week we were reading in Romans chapter 8, um, verse 1, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So in verse, in verse uh, 3 there, <clears throat> or excuse me, in verse 2 he says, uh, For the law of the Spirit of life in, in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Law there, or, or sin there rather, is given position. It's, it's as if it's given personality. And then, and then the law of sin, is, or sin is condemned by God in the flesh in, in the end of verse 3. And so it, we have this image of, of sin being represented in court. Sin comes. And sin is dispossessed of its possessions. It's, it's almost like a, like a court proceeding where land is taken from someone. That's exactly what happens here to sin. Uh, sin is, is, is dispossessed of what it has. And that's important to you and I. Uh, it, as, as we think about our ancestries, those that went before us that, that lived under that law, uh, they, they could not live it perfectly. They, they, could, they, they could receive atonement but they couldn't receive the true forgiveness. And, and it's not until Christ comes and accomplishes that. So God, through Christ, condemns sin in the flesh. And, and uh, it, we spent a fair bit of time talking about that. And, 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 of course, that's what gives us opportunity of forgiveness. And, and when you and I put ourselves in contact with that plan, we can acquire that. We can, we can receive that. Uh, and so that's very important. And, and so I think it's, it's, remember, it's important to remember um, the, 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 who's, who's writing and who they're writing to. And, and we can't forget that we, we have a part in this. We have something to do. We need to put ourselves uh, in contact with, with his plan. And so as we go forward here and we start talking about forgiving one another, that's also going to be important to remember um, I saw, um, you know, some, sometimes I watch things online and I see, um, you know, I like, I like political debate and discussion and, and, and that kind of will always lead into religious thoughts and, and people that would, um, you know, uh, put the two together and, and really try and, uh, I don't know, condemn people for their beliefs maybe is a good way to say it. And, um. You know, one, one thing I saw here just recently was the thought that, that Jesus would love this person. And it was a person that we, you and I would all recognize being caught in sin. Um, and, you know, there's some truth to that. Uh, Jesus loves all mankind. Uh, Jesus displayed that as, as he walked on the earth. And, and yet, you know, a couple weeks ago we talked about how the Pharisees looked down their noses at Jesus because... He and his disciples were spending time with who? The sinners, right? And Jesus' reply was, was what? I, I did not come, the, the well did not need a physician, but rather the sick. And, and that, was, that was kind of an interesting statement because we recognize that the people that were questioning him are sick. They are spiritually not well. But Jesus is telling him, them that, that the physician has come for those that are sick. And the difference is the tax collectors and, and the harlots or whoever he was taking time up with were people that had something going on within them, didn't they? They were having a change of heart. They were having a change of mind. And they were hearing his message and they were responding to it. And so, well, Jesus does love all humanity. He certainly does. Remember, he looked at Jerusalem, the city that had persecuted his prophets, the, the city that was going to uh, ultimately hang him on the cross, and he yearned for them to be faithful. But, but so many were not listening to his words, were not warming, were not softening their heart. But those that were, those were the ones that he was spending the time with. And so it's kind of a... a, a uh, a rude argument to say, well, God loves all, and thereby 
condone a sin that one is caught in. No, God, or Jesus rather, would love that individual but would hate the sin. He would tell them to what? Go and sin no more. And so, you know, we, we need to remember that. And, and, we, we, and I think as we start to talk about forgiveness towards one another, that's something that we're going to want to remember too. And, and I, I think uh, with a couple class periods, we're going to come into some harder questions when it comes to forgiveness. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'll tell you right now, I think, I think when it comes to forgiving an individual that has not asked for it, or uh, um, blanket forgiveness to individuals that obviously don't deserve it, that will maybe never come and apologize to me? <laughs> uh, what role does, where does that play in my spirituality? What, what role does that have in my spiritual life, in my, in my spiritual wellness towards God? Um, as we talk today, we're going to talk about one another, and I think that's pretty clear cut. But, you know, I think of I think of Jesus on the cross in in, in um, Luke chapter twenty three uh, about thirty four where he says forgive them for they know not what they do what was happening there the soldiers were crucifying him and he cries out Lord forgive them for they know not what they do well just a little heads up on where we're headed with this well were were those soldiers guilty of other sins than that one absolutely. Was, was their condemnation hell's eternity because of sins rather than the one of nailing him to the cross? Yes. And yet Jesus asked his father to forgive them because they know not what they do. And I, I don't know why that verse is there other than to tell me that I need to think about that. that, that that's got to have some kind of bearing on the, on the things that happened to me. And so, I don't know. <laughs> I'm working through a lot of that, just as I'm sure a lot of you are. But today I want us to talk about forgiving one another. Um, so, uh, turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll look at, at three passages very quickly here that I think um, kind of summarize what we would think of after we've talked about God's Forgiveness for you and I. So Ephesians 4, verse 32. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Uh, notice that here, here we're talking about the attitude or the, the position that we are supposed to have. We're supposed to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave uh, or has forgiven you. And so here we are couched in position of where forgiveness is, right? It's by God through Christ. And, and this, this also brings up another question to me. Uh, we get so concerned about you wronging me or me wronging you. In a way, that's almost silly. Because who am I to be wronged? Who are you to have a problem? Now, I know we all have feelings. I know we all are, are soft individuals. And, and a hurt is real. I understand it. I have been hurt. <coughs> and yet, when I look at God and what God has put up with, if you will, man, it almost seems silly, doesn't it? Some of the things that get us worked up. Just think about that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Um, starting in verse 12. Colossians 3, verse 12. Uh, so, as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kind heartedness, kindness, excuse me, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So, here again. And, and more so in this verse, because of what God has done for us, the forgiveness extended to you and I, notice again, couched or framed within our Christianity, that, that, that thought that God has, has condemned sin, 
has given us the ultimate atonement or forgiveness in Christ Jesus, that we are to have these attitudes or these, these things represented within us. Uh, a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with, uh, with one another, uh, forgiving each other. Why? Uh, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And so, uh, you know, so, so many times we, we see examples in scriptures, and yet uh, the examples of Christ oftentimes seem to be the ultimate, right? Uh, so, so Christ's uh, example of, of humility, of service, of washing the disciples' feet, we can't outdo that. Uh, there, there, you, you can't, uh, I, I don't think you can come up with, a, with an example in scripture of humility and of service as to a deity wrapping himself in a towel and washing the feet of the, of the men that had been following him. And thereby showing you and I the life of duty and service and that that, that we uh, should employ. And, and we'll never outlive that example, right? Well, here, the example is set again and, and is one that cannot be outdone. The forgiveness granted to you and I is so immeasurable in comparison. Uh, we should be able to forgive our brother. And that seems so simple until we have to do it. Right? And so we are, we are challenged with that. But there's verse 2. Any thoughts on Colossians? Yeah, Mark. Yeah. Ephesians, this uses the term tender heart. It's really the only right. point, you know, what tender heart it is. But this kind yeah. of explains it. Expands it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and then, but as, as we, you know, so many times I like to read things backwards once you read it forward, but if, if you read that backwards then, and you can see how those attitudes building upon each other are going to allow you to be forgiving. They're going to allow you to have uh, approachability. Uh, how many times have you been wronged by somebody and you don't even know how to approach them? You, you're, you're scared to death to go say something to them. That's a very real thing. Uh, and yet, if, if we embody these, these uh, characteristics, um, e even that will be possible. Um, any, anybody else in Colossians 3? Let's look at the next one, Matthew chapter 6. And I promised you a connection to debt last week when we um, kind of teased today's lesson, and here it is. And this is just kind of where where we're going to camp on uh, for the rest of the class period and this idea of debt. In Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 14, Matthew six fourteen, For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Once again, you, you, have to, you cannot take one verse and pull it out of context um, and, and stake your uh, eternal soul on it. This verse says, For if you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That doesn't mean that I can accept the attitude as, as a, uh, uh, an occupant of earth here that uh, you can never wrong me. If you wrong me, I will never hold it against you because heaven is mine. It takes more than that. This is in the context of other things, right? What has just happened before this? Well, that, that didn't happen before that. That's a very good answer. <laughs> a, little, a little closer to both. <laughs> That's kind of the Ken would usually say to me. <laughs> I love it. Um, it's, it's the Lord's Prayer, right? They come to him asking him, how do, we, how do we talk to our Heavenly Father? And, 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 and so we have verse 8. So, do not be like them, for your Father knows uh, what you need before you ask. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, verse 9, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom uh, and the power of the glory forever. And then, if you forgive others their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Heavenly Father will not forgive uh, your transgressions. Uh, the, the, the phrase, um, 
forgive us our debts, verse 12, as we have also forgiven our debtors, is, is talking to wrongs between us. It's talking about injustices that happen between one and another. And, and he, he clarifies that. And think of this. He, he gives them an ideal or, or a template of prayer. And within that then, he clarifies at the end the importance of forgiveness. And, and it's, it's based on the idea that God has forgiven you so much, you need to forgive your brother. Uh, here again, in the confines, who, it's Jesus. We can't argue with the author. <laughs> the, 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 the audience are his people, the people that are striving to faithfully serve him. And so with, within that context again, uh, we need to forgive one another because of what God has forgiven us. Um, notice that the passage is, is pre his death on the cross. It's before the understanding that he is becoming this perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. And yet, Jesus can say this. Isn't it interesting? He can put that before them, knowing full well what's going to take place. It's as good as done. It's as, it's as, it's as much as already happened. Any thoughts about Matthew chapter 6? <clears throat> so there's a connection back to debt. And that's really what forgiveness seems to be. Um, or seems, seems to have this tremendous comparison in scripture to would be a forgiveness of debt. And right away you're starting to think of a passage that, that speaks exactly to that. Um, our debt is very small in comparison um, our debt with God in fact was immeasurable uh, so to forgive like God is to completely absolve or release our brother that, that sounds a lot like that court case with sin right where sin is, is dispossessed of its ownership we completely absolve or release our brother or some might say to grant grace is, is a really deep definition of, of that type of forgiveness. And that's exactly what God does to us. He grants us a measure of grace. Um, let's first look at, before we move on, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I promise you three verses will do four. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, we're really going to focus on 18 and 19, but let's start back in verse 14. Um, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Remember last week we talked about that, the one man Adam and the one man Christ, by one man sin into the world, and by one man the salvation from sin uh, comes into the world. And we talked about how that, that does not mean... Uh, um, original sin or, or sin attached to infants or those that are in, innocent but rather uh, that, that uh, through the law and, and we read that whole that whole uh, segment where we, we become um, uh, we become aware if you will of sin verse 15 and he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. You know, what, what he's saying here is Paul saying, we, we physically knew the man, but we don't know him that way anymore. We only know him now in spirit. As we know one another, in fact, we don't recognize one another, if we're doing this correctly in fleshly terms, but, but our brothers and sisters are more than that, right? Uh, and so, so there's no division uh, like there was. And that, I think that's very important when we, we consider the subject here, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's the difference. And that's, that's Paul's audience. He says, we're new. We, we've been renewed. We're regenerated. We're, the old is gone. It's been put away. That question of dying. We've died to self. And we've arisen anew. 
uh, verse 18. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciled to the world, reconciled, excuse me, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So God, God, um, God produced reconciliation, and now that's our mission going out. We, we go to, to others and say, be reconciled to him. And what is reconciliation? Not counting their trespasses against them. That's what God did for us. There are trespasses or sins against him, and he has not counted those. And so if, if we refer that back to debt, it's the release of a debt. Um, it, but, th but that's what this reconciliation is. And so when we think about one another, that's what we're going to do. We're not going to count the trespasses of our brother or sister against them. And, and to, to me, this just makes me think of so many things. And I mentioned a couple weeks ago as we were getting close to the study that I think a lot of times, uh, I'll just use my, I, I have an issue with you. But I don't come and tell you, and you don't know that. And I know this to be the case. I've seen it in uh, brethren. <laughs> and for years, I will carry this baggage with me, this issue that I have with you, never telling you about it. And I wonder to myself, who's in the wrong? Now, I, I know that's not right. I know it's not right to hold something against my brother but never go to them. But I wonder if I'm hurting my brother in not telling them what the wrong was, how it hurt me, what I'd like to see changed, whatever it would be. A am I hindering them? Am I putting a stumbling block between before them, even though they don't know of my problem. I'm just asking. I, 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 that's, that's the kind of thing that bothers me. That's the kind of thing that makes me wonder, could I be hurting my brother, even though they don't know? Because I guarantee you, as I interact with that person, there's going to be something there, right? There's going to be a holding back, there's going to be a not this openness that there should be. Uh, and, you know, I know that time cures things. I know that time takes things away and, and problems dissolve. And that's probably a very fortunate thing for us. It's just very unfortunate it does take so long. Um, I guess that's something to think of. Any thoughts there in uh, the 2 Corinthians? Yeah, Mark. That Jesus on the cross will give them, they know mm -hmm. not what they do. That's probably some of the most <coughs> important words that Jesus mm -hmm. spoke in reference to us in our Christian walk because he, how could he be the perfect sacrifice without them words? That showed his true heart. I mean, what worse thing yeah. can somebody do to you than physically kill yeah. you? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear of people that hold grudges and mm -hmm. unforgiveness their whole life. And then maybe yeah. on their deathbed, you hear they finally reconciled with somebody right. that it was a known fact in the family or the community or right. whatever that they despised each other right. and, and uh, glared at each other or yep. snapped their neck real quick every yep. time they seen each other, but they finally resolved it, you know. Um, but what better example did Jesus give us on the importance of a, a pure heart? You yeah. Know, yeah, that's a really good thought. Uh, you're right. Without those words, I, I guess we would be left to wonder, wouldn't we? I mean, you and I... He easily yeah. gave up his life and, and with right. hatred towards those that were standing right, right in front of him and spitting on right. him. And, right. And which one of us could have said those words? You yeah, know, you know, means us. and so many times, you know, like I mentioned, why, why are those words there? Well, there were men that followed shortly after that went through the same thing in, in a likeness, right? When, when Stephen and the others then were martyred, those words had to be on their mind as that was happening, wouldn't you think? And so Christ is their ultimate example, even as they think something very similar. 
um, you and I today, I, I'm, I'm not, and, and we can talk about this more, I'm not, I'm not sure it means that I should just blanket forgive everybody that's ever wronged me. Um, but, I, but I think there is a, a, a place where for my own health and my goodness, uh, for my, my mental state, I don't want to carry stuff around. I don't, I don't want to be chained to something that, that dogs me the rest of my life. I just, I, I, don't, I don't want to be like that. Something to think about. Any, any other thoughts there, especially here in 2 Corinthians? Yeah. I think this thought constantly goes back to like having children, and we want them to come to us when they have issues yeah. and be open about it, and we just need to continuously like model behavior mm-hmm. that we want them yeah. to showcase when we are not willing to talk to our sisters and brothers in Christ um, about issues that we have, then how can we expect our own children to right. come to us when they have issues? Yep. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. You know, I think the grace of God is really important to two of us in our physical mind. It's very, very difficult for us to put things aside and, and think of the past and that. I mean, we may not hold a grudge and certainly not hate anybody, mm-hmm. but to wipe it out of our minds like, like, like our Savior did uh, is very, very difficult. We're, we're, that's the human part of us. And I think sometimes the grace of God is you know, bring back a, an old memory of mine when my grandfather they had kind of a war, and he's a Christian. He's the reason that we were that we're faithful today. Mm-hmm. Remember my grandfather, mm-hmm. but a neighbor had Redbird planted on the fence line, mm-hmm. and they fought over those berries that spread over on our side. You know, grandpa go out to pick them, and she just had a fit, mm-hmm. and and there was kind of a war between them. And I don't know that my grandfather ever. Yeah. Apologize for her ever straightened that out. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I just want to think of the times that yeah. the grace of our God is is right. plentiful. Right. Right. Um and, and you know, when you when you think about this debt and you think about this forgiveness, uh and, and so we we are to, to recreate that in our lives with our brothers and sisters because God has done that for us. I mean he completely completely absolves us of those wrongdoings. And I think so many times oh, we'll, we'll forgive our brother or sister of that great debt. But in the back of our mind, they still owe us a buck. <laughs> we just won't get rid of it all. We just cannot say it's over. <laughs> or there's consequences, you know. I, I know there's consequences or problems. I understand that. But, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll scratch that wound occasionally. Or as the baby of Ruth, yeah. be near me. That yeah, yeah, right. Interact. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and uh, there are some very real situations where uh, sin produces consequences that, that are going to cause a person pain going forward. Um. You know, there's there's situations where if if someone is abusive to children, that can be forgiven of. But there's a consequence that goes with that is that we're gonna we're gonna understand that that person is is not going to be trusted to a point where they would be put back into temptation, and and that would be incumbent upon us to do that. That doesn't mean that we can't forgive them, and that, and we need to. Uh, but there would be situations. But so many times, over petty things, we will um, we will create um, conditions or or build walls within our own lives uh, that we shouldn't do. Okay, let's turn to Matthew chapter eighteen. Uh, ultimately, you know, this is where we were headed with this, and and it's a passage that we're all very familiar with. Um, and, and we, something that we have studied several times in this Bible class, uh, but not, not, in, not necessarily in this context. But in Matthew chapter 18, uh, starting in verse 21, Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother, or how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, who, who knows the background here? What is Peter asking? What is, what is Peter's position as he brings this? 
thought and question to Jesus. In in coming up is 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 this parable, right? About about the release of death. But what 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 do you know about Peter and what he's asking here? Is seven a good number? Seven in, in scripture means completeness, uh, per perfect, per or perfection. And, and do you know what um, <clears throat> so rabbinical teaching at this point um, rabbis were, were telling and teaching that you had to forgive a person basically three times they were going off of passages in Amos uh, chapter 1 verse 3 and chapter 2 verse 1 I believe Amos chapter 1 verse 3 Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Damascus And for four I will revoke its punishment Because of the threshold uh, Because they thresh Gilead with implements of sharp irons Chapter 2 verse 1 Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Moab And for four uh, I will not revoke its punishment Because uh, he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime And so the thought was And, and I think I think quite incorrectly uh, by the teachers of the day that you had to forgive someone three times when, when they wronged you. And with four, that was it. Uh, but Peter comes to Jesus, uh, likely knowing this or understanding, because remember, their view of Scripture was very legalistic at this point, right? What do I have to do? That's what I want to I want to know how far I have to go. And that was their legalistic approach. And so when Peter comes to Jesus, he says, uh, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? And, and I'm probably saying that with the wrong inflection because I think Peter's saying this, thinking that he's got a really good idea. I'm, I'm going above and beyond and this has got to be a correct answer. After all, seven's this complete number. It's this perfect number. And yet Jesus said to him, verse two, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, ultimately, we say 70 times 7 is what kind of number? Infinite. Infinite. It means you. every time your brother comes to you, you forgive him. Uh, and yet, 70 times 7 is an actual specific number. 490, right? And 490 is a very real number. It is a specific number. And if you, if you listen to... Um, uh, the Jewish teachers, even to this day, uh, they'll tell you that, that the Hebrew language was one of, uh, uh, written with letters and numbers. It, it's very a numeric language, if you will. And all of these, these words had a number correlation. And, and I'm, I'm getting a bit in the weeds here, my understanding of this, as I've, I've only studied so much of this, but uh, Bethlehem, uh, nativity, this, this, these words equal 490. And Bethlehem is a city of bread. Right? According to uh, looking at what words, words mean the cities, all of this. The city of bread. And when you go back to the, the model prayer that we just had, the part of that prayer was what? Give us our daily bread. And as I read that, I always just picture... God sustaining us with what we need, our, our bread. But you know, it's likely a little more than that. It's likely the forgiveness that you and I require to, to, to make it. And the, the thought immediately goes to forgiving our brother upon that. Forgiving us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so, 49 has a lot of symbolism, too. The 49 and then the year of Jubilee, right? And what happened in the year of Jubilee? Remember, remember? If you watch the Passion, or if you watch the, I was going to say Passion, right? If you watch the Chosen series, there was one episode that really talked about this a lot. It's where Jesus goes into the synagogue, 
back in, in, in his hometown, remember? And he reads the passage, and then they start talking. He starts talking about the day of Jubilee. And, and the whole question is whether or not we as a people need um, uh, forgiveness. And, and Jesus makes the point that it's upon them. The year of Jubilee is upon them. So 49 years in the year of Jubilee, what happens at that time? Oh, there, were and yeah, debts, slaves were set free. If you had lost land because of hardship, it was returned to its original. There, the land was what? Kept fallow for the year. There was no planting or harvesting. And so you had this reset, if you will. And in Daniel, we have the expression of 490 being prophesied uh, in chapter 9. And as, as it's looking forward to the Christ or to, to uh, another prophecy about, about Jesus, it's 490 years and this ultimate atonement is going to take place. It's like the jubilee of all jubilees, if you will. And so we have, we have Jesus telling Peter that no, not seven times, it's 70 times seven. In fact, it, it almost appears as though he's pointing to a forgiveness that's equal to the forgiveness that you are going to receive. Remember, Jesus is saying this before the happening, right? Jesus is still with us, not crucified yet. He hasn't risen from the grave. He hasn't become that perfect sacrifice yet. He's still living towards that. But he's telling Peter that you're going to forgive or you need to forgive in the way that God is going to forgive you in this ultimate jubilee year, this, this, this complete reset of not just our people, but all people. And so um, it's really interesting. It's, it's a, it's, I think when, 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 when you think of 70 times 7, and, and I, I, I'm not saying that Peter understood that at the moment, but I'll bet you it wasn't long and he did, that, that what was being talked about was this ultimate atonement, uh, this, this something better that was coming. Talked way back in Daniel about this. Any thoughts about that before we move on? The second bell down. Okay, okay. So, just a little insight. Um, we talked about uh, verse twenty-one and twenty-two. Uh, verse twenty-three will start the uh, parable of the king that wanted to settle accounts, and we will talk about that or pick up there in two weeks because next week we have visitors here with us for camp. Thanks for your attention.